Thank you. Right, so as we, uh, we're, we're regurgitating now, this is the cycling. Um, we're good at cycling. We, you know, we, 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 the French called us cheats last time because we applied too much technology. Um, we could call us cheats again. But anyway, we're winning lots of medals. Um, and real world crypto. It, there, for a few years, there has been a little bit of a, 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 um, a competition between crypto and real world crypto to decide which is the bigger crypto conference held every year. And I think crypto this year has won it. But um, we, we want to make sure that in New York, real world crypto wins it for 2017. So we'd like you all to turn up to real world crypto in 2017. For those of you who don't know what it's about, it's, well, it's about real world and crypto. So there we go. And it needs you, OK? So um, kind of 100-year-old um, uh, advert. We need you for contributed talks, sponsorship, and Levchin Prize nominations. So for those of you who don't understand any of these things, let me explain what's going on. We have contributed talks. So not the, the, what's the cool thing about real world crypto is we vet everybody who talks so we can guarantee you everyone is a good speaker and is talking about something really interesting. Um, it's a bit the same way like Kenny's done the rump session, which is why the rump session, and Martin, why the rump session is so good. It's because they've done the vetting. Okay, so... Um, so not only do we invite people to talk at Real World Crypto, you can also contribute a talk or suggest a talk. And the deadline for submissions is October the 1st. Um, paper submissions can be full 10-page papers, a short two-page abstract, presentation slides, or just, I'm cool, can I give a talk type thing. Might not really take those ones seriously, but there we go. But anyway, um, what, all you've got to do is explain what your talk's going to be about, and we will then vet them, and we might give you an invite, and you can come along and present your wares to uh, a wide community of academics and industrialists. It's about 60% of the people there are uh, uh, academics, and about 40% are from industry, so it's a pretty nice uh, uh, balance. But talking of uh, uh, industry, we're looking for sponsors. Putting on a conference of 500 people is very expensive. A lot of you have paid a lot of money to come here. The registration fees for real-world crypto are tiny. The reason we do this is we get shed loads of money from industry. Shed loads is a proper objective to use when you come to money. You may have noticed it's a kind of English thing. We have shed loads of money all the time. If you want to donate us shed loads of money, please talk to me or Kenny or Dan Bonnet, and we will, we will gladly take the money off you, okay? <laughs> we, uh, quicker than you can just basically say no. So please give us, we really need your money, I must stress. Otherwise, poor academics are going to have to pay reasonable registration fees, and they don't like doing that. So if you're sitting next to an industrialist and you're an academic, get them to get their checkbook out now, right? Okay, the, um, but... You've got, there's something in it for you as well because someone has put their money, uh, their hand into their pocket and given us a shed load of money to give out as prize money. Every year, Real World Crypto hands out two $10,000 prizes which have been donated by Levshin, who, if you don't know, founded PayPal and all sorts of other things. And we give it to people teams for sustained contributions to Real World Crypto or important technical contributions. So we want nominations for 2017. You can go to the website, levshinprize.com, and you can nominate your favourite um, person to win the prize. Okay. Or someone else, maybe. Um, the previous winners have been uh, Phil Rogway and the MeTLS team, or MyTLS, however you want to pronounce it. But um, if we're, looking for, we're looking for more people to give money to. So not only do we take money from you, we give money out to you as well. So big hand, round of applause for Lev Max Levshin for giving us the money. Okay, and you know it makes sense. Um, you just attend, there's, um, there's the program committee, there's, um, we've got a new member of the program committee, um, and one of those people there is not a cryptographer. <laughs> and votes for who is not the cryptographer. I don't know, which one, who, yeah, I don't know. Top left? <laughs> top right? Who votes top right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bottom left is not a cryptographer. Yeah. It bastards. Um, <laughs> right, bottom right. Okay, someone's serious. Okay, anyway, thank you very much. New York. Oh, uh, where? I don't know. Columbia. Columbia, yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. So we are now going to have a, a special talk, a real-time rebuttal of a previous rum session talk by the man who already did his little dance and now he does something. Okay. Uh, all right, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak uh, out of order. So, um, as you know, uh, recently the National Science Foundation uh, um, has put a requirement uh, that for postdoc you need to send a postdoc mentoring plan. Um, and recently I got some extra experience in this. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some uh, golden rules about postdoc training. Uh, so there are not too many. Um, so first, ask him to play tennis at 7 o'clock every morning. So it's very effective. It's very, you know, it's good for your cardio and uh, otherwise. Um, also good for the postdoc. Uh, ask him to publicize text messages sent to him over a private channel. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, this is kind of to prepare for a cryptanalysis. Um, um, ask him to give funny RAM sessions at the expense of his advisor. So, that's uh, uh, very appreciated. Uh, well, and last but not the least, uh, I think it's actually I learned it uh, on my own experience. Ask him to, pay f uh, to save food for you during opening receptions of uh, crypto conferences. That's it. Thank you. So, next up will be Moti Jung, who will be rep representing Belgium uh, in the ping pong competition. Uh, at the same time, Lily Chen, please get ready. Okay, so this is also a rebuttal. It's a rebuttal to the song that we just heard about uh, believing in Q type assumptions and so on. Uh, yeah, and it's a ping pong, but a very short ping pong game. Uh, it's about non-interactive commitment, so, uh, which is essentially a primitive that emulates uh, a public safe. You put something in the safe and then you can open it and everybody knows it's there and it has to be the property of not hinding, but hiding and binding. And uh, originally it was uh, done uh, for a bit or for one value, but it makes sense to combine it with uh, various data structures and have more complicated commitments. And uh, there are uh, known generalization and extensions, so concise uh, vector commitment. That's like a, a, a lot of uh, data committed in, uh, in small values. An application is zero knowledge databases uh, with queries. Uh, polynomial commitments uh, that you kind of uh, commit to polynomial values and then reveal uh, evaluations and so on. And then accumulators, uh, an, an older construction in which you can accumulate like hash that accumulated, accumulate uh, uh, results and uh, in all these areas there are uh, uh, remaining questions which are about the efficiency and the assumptions. So a lot of the efficient implementations rely on this Q-type non-constant size assumption that uh, if you query many times it's still, uh, you know, anyway you heard about those beliefs uh, before. So. Uh, so there are remaining questions in these areas and, and, uh, and they kind of uh, look to us a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, under the same umbrella. So we suggested the generalization is a functional commitment to all of them in, uh, in order to, to exploit all these, all these similarities and, uh, and uh, look at it in a, a more abstract level in a way that it be, will be a helpful and then one solution will lead to answering other, uh, other questions in, in the related commitment. And, um, and, the, and the idea is that uh, re revealing the commitment uh, in the functional commitment uh, does not reveal uh, the value, but reveal function of the value and the hiding is relative uh, uh, to hiding the, the, the potential messages that uh, corresponds to pre-images of these uh, values, okay? And uh, 
and, uh, and uh, we consider in particular all these areas, uh, uh, the, this functionality for linear functions. And uh, we have a construction a functional commitment for linear function based on composite order pairing. Uh, commitment size is, uh, is constant and uh, the, com the key size is uh, linear. Uh, it's perfectly hiding, it's uh, computationally binding, it uh, constant size uh, assumptions, which is the important things to, to, to m make our belief in what we are doing uh, stronger, or the belief weaker and therefore the result stronger. And uh, it uh, employs the Deja Q framework for, for proof from Chase and uh, Michael John and uh, we. And this immediately leads to concise vector commitment with uh, order and public key, which was open in this area under these implementations. Uh, when we look at polynomial commitments, uh, uh, we get the first uh, pairing-based polynomial commitment from constant size assumption. When we translate it, uh, this uh, linear commitment to values of polynomial and apply the previous result, and uh, from polynomial commitments to, we go to accumulators and we get uh, the first pairing based construction from uh, static assumption. So again, it, it strengthens our uh, belief in the construction and less belief on the, I mean, weaker assumptions. And, uh, and we get uh, accumulators that support uh, subset queries. For certain of the data structure games, we need subset queries. And it gives uh, extension to large universe uh, accumulators, uh, pairing based accumulator with uh, short uh, inclusion witness, security from constant size assumption again, not the Q type. And this uh, last result requires uh, extension of the Deja Q framework. So now we have uh, much more belief that you can uh, have these uh, data structures uh, in the various uh, domains uh, based on uh, better assumptions and better efficiency. So thank you very much. It's available on ePrint. Okay, so next up is going to be Lily Shen on behalf of NIST. And uh, David, please get ready. So. Okay, so now NIST uh, uh, PQC team hold the torch, Olympic torch, come to the, this room and give an uh, announcement. So what kind of game this is? PQC post-quantum cryptography. So um, uh, NIST published a uh, uh, federal uh, uh, register notice in August uh, 2, just uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, this uh, announcement is to request for public uh, comments on our requirements and uh, evaluation criteria about uh, post-quantum cryptography standardization. Um, so this time is different. The, the game rule is a little bit different. And um, so the federal register notice only have this uh, request uh, for public uh, comment. The proposed uh, requirements and uh, evaluation criteria is in our website. So it's uh, nisa.gov slash PQ crypto. So um, the deadline is September uh, uh, 16. Um, so, okay, uh, this is not a competition and it's more than a competition. So why we are seeing that? Because in this uh, uh, standardization, the scope is not a single block cipher or a single pa uh, hash function. This is about uh, the digital signature, key establishment, and the key, uh, public key based encryption. So in this, uh, 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 we have the proposed requirements. 
I really like it to get the attention that in these requirements, we have secure definitions and we have the security strengths. The secure strength is not only for the classical secure strength, but uh, for the quantum secure strength. So we like to uh, just uh, to like to know your opinion. So this is a timeline. It's about the uh, uh, seven-year uh, timeline. So by the next Olympic game. We are still in the mid middle of this competition, or not a competition. So the first step is we wanted to publish the uh, uh, former call for uh, uh, sub proposals. So the then the first step first, and uh, so we wanted to know what you think about these requirements. This is like a swimming pool, uh, the swimming game. The water is deep for the post-quantum cryptography. So remember, the deadline is about one month from today. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. So next up will is uh, David and Evo. Please get ready. Cool. David. Thanks for the intro. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some of our recent work on functional encryption. This is joint work with Shisheng. So, well, we're all playing a crypto Olympic game. So Venetius, Tom, and our friends here, they're all happily competing. Everyone's having fun. But then the Donald comes along, and he's not happy. He's like, I didn't win. Well, what does the Donald do? Well, he goes onto his favorite messaging platform and complains that everything is rigged against him. So the question is, is the Olympic Games rigged against the Donald? And how can we help the Donald out? Well, one thing we can do is we can audit the records. Let's say all of the competitors, they take all of their health records, they publish them, we take a random sample of them, we check if there's any suspicious activity going on. Well, as cryptographers, we're conscious about the privacy. right? We don't want to publish all of our health records, and they're clear. So let's use crypto. Let's encrypt the records. So now what has our problem reduced to? Well, the abstract formulation of our problem can be the quest following. How do we sample a random record from an encrypted database? This seems like it falls under the general umbrella of functional encryption. So in a functional encryption scheme, secret keys are associated with a function f. And basically, given a ciphertext or an encryption of a message m and a secret key for f, you apply the decryption operation. And magic, you get the function evaluation at the message. But a natural question then becomes, what happens if this function is randomized? What if this function takes in some random points? And especially in our case, if we're trying to audit an encrypted database, we're sampling a random element, and the integrity of the audit process is, fun is critical that we have good randomness. So what do we do here? Well, first we have to define the notion. So in a randomized functional encryption scheme, the decryption function is still going to be a deterministic process. It's going to take a message m, take a secret key for a function f that could take random points, and the output of the decryption function is actually should look like a random draw from the distribution of the function evaluated on the underlying plain text. And moreover, if we have two messages encrypted, and we apply the same decryption function, which the key got to destroyed somehow, uh, if we apply the decryption function, it just looks like two independent draws from the function evaluated on the underlying inputs. So if we look at this, the question then becomes, does do functional encryption schemes for randomized functionalities exist? If we look at the setting for uh, deterministic functionalities, it's great. We have schemes from public key encryption all the way up to schemes using multilinear maps and indistinguishability obfuscation. So a wide variety of uh, construction based on different kinds of assumptions. The story is much less rosy when we look at functional encryption schemes for randomized functionalities. In fact, we really only have one construction in a, ra in a public key setting, and that's using this very powerful primitive obfuscation. And moreover, it only achieves selectively secure. Uh, so the natural question then that we want to ask here is does extending functional encryption to support this richer class of functionalities, namely these randomized functionalities, necessitate that we move to much stronger assumptions such as I.O.? And the answer that we pre uh, present in this work is no. In fact, we show a compiler, a generic compiler, that takes any general purpose functional encryption scheme that works for deterministic functionalities, along with very mild number theoretic assumptions, such as DDH and RSA. And what we produce is actually a general purpose functional encryption scheme for the full class of randomized functionalities. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very high level overview of the construction. 
And the starting point of our construction is de-randomization. We have to produce the randomness from somewhere, because ultimately, we're going to use a deterministic functional encryption scheme. So where are we going to get the randomness from? Well, as cryptographers, we typically resort to uh, pseudo-random functions. So we're going to put a key inside the function and basically evaluate the function using uh, randomness derived from the PRF on evaluated on the input. This is all good and all, but unfortunately, if we look at normal functional encryption schemes, the secret keys don't hide the function. In particular, the secret key is not going to hide the PRF key, and the output of the PRF is no longer random if you know what the key is. So this actually doesn't work at all. So the naturalness solution is to secret share the key. We're going to split the key and give some power to the encryptor. So now the key is, so there's part of the key that's built into the functionality, part of the key is supplied by the encryptor itself. Uh, if we do this, we get a little closer, but this actually, it turns out, doesn't quite work. And in particular, if we get back to our original problem of trying to do it, uh, an audit, the problem is that the encryptor has way too much control over how he generates the ciphertext. And in particular, by influencing the choice of the key, or even the random coins used to generate the ciphertext in the underlying functional encryption scheme, he can actually induce very bad distributions. And this actually destroys the security of the scheme. So it turns out that to actually get the full power of our construction, we require a few more tools, and this is where we use the algebraic assumptions. So using DDH and RSA, uh, we use magnetic arguments, PRF secure against related key attacks, and techniques even from deterministic encryption, and this actually allows us to obtain simulation secure randomized functional encryption from any uh, simulation secure uh, deterministic functional encryption. And moreover, the key here is that the security properties of our underlying FE scheme are preserved. So we actually get the first adaptively secure uh, functional encryption scheme for randomized functionalities. Thank you. And our paper is available on ePrint. Next up, we'll be representing the Time Lords, Ivo Desmet. So what happened is that Kenny told me and said, you know, if you're giving an obsession talk, it has to be about the Olympic Games. And it turned out that just a few days ago, I was talking to my friends of Japan, and they say we should move crypto to Tokyo, because in four years' time, the Olympic Games will be in Tokyo, and then all people from crypto can attend the Olympic Games. So I thought, but yeah, but there are no Olympic Games in Santa Barbara. So why actually tie the REM session to the Olympic Games? And then I remembered, there used to be Olympic Games in Santa Barbara, okay? And some of you may remember this. And so the question is, is this a joke or is this a true story? And I see some people in the front row say, oh yes, we remember this. Yes, this is actually a picture of how UCSB used to look. And if you look carefully, you actually see the, the, the hall, a la capa hall, there in the back. And so that's how it was transformed. Now, did any of us saw that? No, because when we arrived, all this was demolished, okay? And so there is an official report. It says official report. You can clearly see that. If I find the pointer here. Yeah, official report. So we're, you see, official report. This thing is out of battery. Anyway, so it says official report. And it says UCSB was used to house more than 800 rowing and canoeing, kayaking athletes, etc. Okay, and UCSB was a complete village in terms of services provided. And it's amazing. If I would have been given here 20 minutes, I could give a whole talk and all the slides that are on there. It's incredible. You see the campus in a way you have never seen. So go there and look at it. It's really, really incredible. So what the heck is the link to crypto? Soon afterwards, crypto 1984 took place at UCSB. Now, what happened is that Air France was very smart. All the tickets that you tried to buy in Europe to fly to Santa Barbara, Air France had the monopoly on that. The price it costed was the same as flying from Paris to Los Angeles, okay? So if you want to fly LA to here and you bought your ticket in Europe, yeah, it was crazy expensive. And there's a long story. This is just a short version. So yes, it was very interesting coming here and people telling you, oh, you know, just recently the Olympics were here and yeah, they used to be there. And now it's even more crazy. Do you know that 1984 was that long time ago? Now, you think I made a mistake. Uh, some people on the first row saw it. This is binary 32. Ah, but I think that we should change. And we as computers, 
We as computer scientists should advocate binary anniversaries. <laughs> Why? So we should switch to binary birthdays, because what happens is that if you switch to bir uh, binary birthdays, then you have exponentially fast vanishing birthdays. <laughs> who, who remembers basically uh, the, the uh, yeah, the battle in Waterloo, okay? When, what day was it and what year? Ah, most people don't remember it. But people remember the end of World War II, yeah. And the next generation, yeah, maybe they will no longer remember it. So depending on the importance, you will remember it. And by having f exponentially fast vanishing birthdays, they will automatically become irrelevant, okay? So who will remember the next time, that means in extra 32 years, 64 years after the event of the, of the Olympic Games. Who will talk about the Olympic Games in Santa Barbara? Eh, maybe, nobody. But anyway, Kenny, thanks for this inspiration. I think it was the great time to do it exactly so many years after the Olympic Games. Talk about it in the REM session. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Susan Langford and uh, Alex, please get ready. Susan. All right, I'm here today to talk to you about derived unique key per transaction, officially pronounced duck putt. And I promise you that I will try to make this talk exactly as exciting as watching our ducks' favorite Olympic sport, golf. <laughs> so duck putt is a symmetric key derivation protocol that was developed for payment terminals. And the idea is that you have perfect forward secrecy in the terminal. So when somebody quietly walks away with the terminal from Walmart, they don't steal anything of value. The, not, you don't have perfect forward secrecy at the server. You have one key that lets the server talk to up to 10,000 point of sale terminals at a time. Now, it was originally developed in the 1980s for single des. It was then kind of hacked to make it work for triple des. And now the ANSI X9F6 financial subcommittee is actually trying to clean it up and make it use AES in a secure way. I am sure that at this point in the evening, all of you really want to go over formulas, right? Yeah, all right. It's a tree-based key derivation scheme. Please read the paper if you care. <laughs> Again, at the terminal, you keep parts of the tree, you throw away keys as you use them. So what did we change as we modernized this? Well, some of it was just pure cleanup. There was a very lovely 21-bit counter that the programmers just adored. <laughs> we got rid of that. It's a 32-bit counter. By alignment, it's a lovely thing. Um, we also, and this is the most important part and the reason we want people to look at this, we cleaned up the key derivation. Our key derivation is now based on the NIST SP800-108 key derivation technique. We use the counter mode. However, as you can see from the very high level description I've given you, we do a huge amount of key derivations for every transaction. And every transaction is eight bytes, 100 bytes max. This is a lot of key derivations. Therefore, instead of using HMAC or even CMAC as the pseudo-random function, we are actually proposing the use of ECB. Now, we understand ECB is not a pseudo-random function. It is a pseudo-random permutation. However, we note that CMAC is also a pseudo-random permutation when your key derivation data is a single block, which is what we are using. So, we cannot see any security problem with using ECB in this function, but that is why we come to you and said, please look at this. Have we missed something? Is there something else we could do? This is almost two times faster to do it this way. And when you're talking about 15 key derivations for eight bytes of data, that's a significant performance impact. So uh, we also have a fun rekeying option that you could use the last key to send in more keys because people are encrypting credit cards now. Where we were only encrypting pins, the life of a pin pad was very long. With credit cards, it's a lot of transactions. They just needed an extension. So that's another thing we'd like some feedback on. Is that a good idea? So uh, this, 
the spec is not quite finished. We will be putting it out on the web as soon as we get our ducks in a row. Uh, this is probably going to be a few weeks to a month from now, but no guarantees. You know how standards bodies work. Uh, the x9.org website will have a copy of this document. If you're interested and you have any problems, email me and I will tell you where it is or put you on the list and notify you when we get it out and get it in a place that you can find it. So, thanks. So, the next speaker will be Alex. His favorite sport is tug of war. Uh, and Hillary, please get ready. So, apparently, tug of war actually was an Olympic sport back in the day, which I think summarizes multilinear maps very well. So, uh, I'll be presenting if this thing works. I'll be presenting uh, a benchmark on multilinear map applications. This is joint work with a lot of different people. So uh, first, I'll mention that this is, comes out of the DARPA Safeware project, which is a program funded by DARPA to study cryptographic program obfuscation and the tools used to develop obfuscation, such as multilinear maps. Um, so the goal here is to understand the security, improve the runtimes as best we can, and more info can be found here. So the goal with these benchmarks is to better understand the concrete security of uh, multilinear maps and their applications. So what's the required effort for the known practical attacks? And what are the security parameter implications of these attacks? So the mechanism of this benchmark is we'll release a bunch of challenges and information on how these challenges were created. And the goal of a participant is to recover the secret. And we'll accept any submission that demonstrates recovery and we'll also rank the submissions by their efficiency and have a leaderboard um, for the most efficient breaks. So the first benchmark is order reviewing encryption. So the basic idea here is you have a data owner who encrypts a bunch of plain texts, and any user can compare the plain text just using the ciphertext and shouldn't be able to learn anything else. So for this benchmark, we'll release 10 ciphertexts and the public parameters used to be able to compare the ciphertext. And the goal of an attacker is to recover uh, a single plain text. The second benchmark is obfuscation, in particular point function obfuscation. So here, a data owner in some sense encrypts a plain text, and a user can compare equality or inequality to that plain text. Um, so the benchmark here is an obfuscation of some function f, where f of x equals 1 for all inputs but 1. And the goal is to recover the x such that f of x equals 0. So in order to win, uh, you have to, of course, satisfy the requirements of the benchmark. You have to break the, break the scheme. Um, you have to make the attack code publicly available to us. We want to build a repository of the known attacks. Um, and we also want to reproduce the attacks on a reference platform so we can get some normalized running time of the break. And we also require that you submit by the end of the year, although that can change depending on how the, the benchmark is going. And we don't actually know what you'll win now, but it's some type of recognition award from DARPA, either anything from a t-shirt to a plaque to money. We're still deciding that. So some more details about these two benchmarks. So uh, first one is ORE. We consider two multilinear maps, GGH Lite, which is based on GGH 13, and CLT 13. And for GGH Lite, uh, we consider the security parameter of 40. And here, what we mean is lambda bits of security. It should take an attacker two to the lambda clock cycles to break. These schemes have known attacks, so it will be quicker than that. Um, so yeah, we have GGH Lite at 40 bits of security, CLT at 80 bits of security. And the same for the point function case, when we set the size of the point to the uh, security parameter. Because these sizes are quite large, um, I don't expect people to be downloading these from the internet. So I have USB keys available for anyone who's interested. Um, I have, I think, 15 or so. So don't use this as an opportunity to get a free 128 gigabyte USB key, but use it as an opportunity to break these schemes. Um, more details. This is uh, based on a framework that we developed that's going to be published at CCS. It's fully open source if you want to play with it. And the most important slide, because this has our website that has a lot more information and an email that you can email us questions, comments, concerns, anything, and the, win and the entries if you have a break. 
And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. So next up will be Hilary Orman. She chose a very specific Olympic discipline, namely the discipline of quilting. Um, so, well, Hilary? Okay, well, I don't think that uh, quilting is an Olympic event, but this is more uh, about memory than quilting. And uh, I think that the uh, original Greeks at the time of the Olympic Games um, would, uh, if they could see forward, they'd be very impressed with uh, the athletics uh, now, but they would be baffled at how bad we are at memorizing anything. I'm a normal computer user. I have a couple of hundred passwords. Uh, I, they're probably even too short by today's standards. I should go back and make them all longer. How in the world can you memorize passwords of that length? Well, we should go back to the, uh, uh, the way the ancient Greeks did it. They had very good memories. Human memory is excellent. It's just kind of hard to control it. Um, so if you want to know about memory championships, which I really think should be in the Olympics, uh, this book, Moonwalking with Einstein, explains a lot about it. Uh, so um, uh, I had an experience here at UCSB, and I was uh, looking at the uh, bedspreads in the dorm, which are, I think, particularly unattractive, and I've seen them a million times. And uh, this is what it looks like. But some, for some reason, when I saw it, I thought it was a beautiful thing, actually. It's got these squares. It's got these extensions. It illustrates the formula uh, uh, n plus 1 squared is n plus 2 n plus 1. It, I mean, it's got all sorts of things going on with it. And I found that the next day, I perfectly remembered this unmemorable design. So um, I uh, had a way of uh, describing it. There, there, are ways of describing uh, geometric things. Uh, but what I came up with uh, on this was I have a 3 square, I've got a 5L, I've got a 7L, I've got 14 dominoes, and a, uh, a 2 square. And I Googled this, and it turns out that uh, it doesn't correspond to anything on the internet. Uh, so uh, this is a, a way of generating fairly long passwords. Um, what I like about it is, I don't have that character string in my memory. I have not sub-vocalized it at all. What I have is the image, and the image leads to the password. Uh, so I uh, propose this as a possible method for uh, being able to enter into real uh, uh, password memorization, which seems to be with us uh, forever. Can you get enough unique passwords from this? I'm not sure, but it is an exponential problem. I think if you go up to around somewhere under 15 by 15, you probably can get enough tessellations and variation on it, uh, especially if you preserve the diagonal symmetry. I propose that security conferences have password memorization contests so that people can come up with more methods like this. So next up will be uh, Yu Sasaki, yes. yes, and uh, Vladimir, please get ready. So, hmm? uh, yes. So, oops. So, okay. Oh, yes. So ah, there we are. Okay. So I'd like to talk about uh, our new impossible uh, differential search tool, and this is joint work with my colleague, Yosuke Todo. So at first, we thought that we made big results, I mean, huge results, like titanic results. But uh, we have to report some uh, research collision in a later in this talk. So OK, so impossible differential has uh, its current anal uh, analysis approach for block ciphers. And uh, at its core, uh, attackers need to find input difference and output difference that can't be connected, so impossible differential propagation. So how to find such impossible differential? So the previous work uh, propagate input difference in the forward, at the same time propagate the output difference in the backward, 
and uh, try to find some contradiction in the middle. This approach is called missing in the middle. Uh, this approach has uh, several issues to be improved. Uh, first, uh, the attackers need to encode some contradicting reasons in, uh, in advance, which is sometimes difficult. And many of the pre previous work is S-box wise analysis. I mean, they didn't uh, consider inside S-box due to some technical difficulties. And attackers need to make code to evaluate impossible differential just for evaluating impossible differential, which is time consuming. So uh, in this talk, uh, in our tool, uh, we want to solve everything. So the result is uh, very good. So first, uh, our, uh, find, uh, our such tool can find any contradicting reason. And our tool can look inside as box. And we can prove a maximum length of impossible differential by assuming MYOL with some uh, assumption. And the, desi the design is universal. I mean, the uh, tool for impossible differential can change to standard differential or linear with, uh, slight, uh, ver with very cheap cost. So the runtime is fast, like one hour per algorithm. So it is very fast, so as fast as uh, Usain Bolt. Uh, the tool can be applied to many ciphers. So it's as versatile as Kohei Uchimura. And the application results are so strong, so as strong as TD Linux. And the tool is going to be as legendary as Michael Phillips. So, What's the idea behind? So the tool is based on a differential linear search with mixed integer linear programming. So in the previous uh, bound search, the input to the tool is a cipher's specification, and then the MILP solvers outputs lower bound of the number of active boxes. So in this research, we additionally specify input difference and output difference. Then run the MILP tool. So the tool returns some error in some times, which means uh, system is invisible. That means delta in and delta out does not have any solution, so they are impossible. So by uh, testing all the input and output differences, then we can exhaustively search all uh, impossible differential. And here is the uh, table for the application results. And as you can see, that the number of uh, impossible differential distinguishers were improved in many ciphers. Uh, in, P in particular, uh, we could analyze some uh, ciphers with 8 bit S boxes. And uh, we can uh, prove uh, maximum length of impossible differential. I don't go into the details there. Uh, technical, uh, I don't explain the technical details, but just wanted to say, like, a lot of ciphers I evaluated here. But then some tragedy occurred. So we started this research from May 28, and the research proceeded in a good pace. But in the July 11, a paper appeared on the imprint. The title is New Automatic Search Tool for Impossible Differential, and blah, 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 from Chinese team. So this is a collision on the research topic. And actually, uh, I read the paper, and uh, this is very good paper, so I recommend everyone to reading it. But I just wanted to uh, make a comparison. So two researchers uh, use exactly the same idea in the, in the basic. But uh, several uh, advantages, uh, they have the, uh, several of their own advantages. For example, the imprint paper extends the tool to ARX or zero coordination analysis, and they found some uh, improved distinction on the height block cipher. Well, uh, we have strong applications, and we propose some techniques to analyze it with this box. So, so in the conclusion, actually, I can see some uh, research collision, but the impact uh, seems not so big. So I hope that two research groups have good futures, and. Yeah, I have such a happy end for our Titanic story. Thank you for your attention. So 
I'm not sure whether iceberg hitting is really an Olympic discipline, but... Uh, so next up will be uh, Vladimir Sukarov, Karev. Uh, and after that, uh, Adi, please get ready for the very last talk. So this will be the penultimate one. Vladimir, please. Uh. Okay. Hello, everyone. So just a quick pre-story. Uh, I prepared my slides before the submission was actually due, and then all of a sudden I read that there is uh, supposed to be an Olympic theme, and I started thinking about it. Well, what should I do? And I realized our founder, Tahir Al-Gamal, has actually taken care of it, because if you look at our logo, it has two of the Olympic rings. So I was set there. And uh, so now we can go to actual crypto here. So. What are the, some challenges that we can sort of see nowadays is one of them is vulnerabilities due to the lack of diversification. Uh, so, you know, one attack can be widely devastating if, you know, there's a lot of systems that are working on the same, using the same crypto systems. Uh, it's easier for adversaries to concentrate on one scheme, so less schemes, more concentration uh, for adversaries per scheme, and uh, so just naturally higher probability of being attacked. So. What is the solution? Well, we use cryptographic agility, uh, so easily changeable cryptography, custom cryptography, and then combination of cryptography so we can construct schemes and make them unique uh, for each other big organization or uh, even a country. Another, of course, uh, threat that is coming up, it's gonna be quantum attacks, and as we know, all asymmetric crypto that is currently being standardized is gonna be broken. And what is safely encrypted today will be broken successfully tomorrow using quantum computers. And if we need long-living secrets, then we're in trouble. And the future, I mean, is fairly near, maybe 15, 20 years. And the solution, of course, is post-quantum cryptography. And uh, there's different approaches, but uh, at some point it was said that ECC is gone, but no, it's not actually gone. If we use isogeny-based super-single elliptic curves, then uh, ECC survives, and we can reuse a lot of libraries and uh, use it for our future implementations on isogeny-based crypto systems. All right, thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, time for the very last uh, talk of this okay. rum session, uh, which apparently is a discipline uh, which has something to do with smart and something to do with screwing. So. I'm worried a little bit, but uh, Adi, please go ahead. Something is screwed up. <laughs> Going back. Okay. This is joint work with Yal Ronen and uh, Achio Weingarten. And uh, as you know, uh, one of the hottest buzzwords today is the Internet of Things. And uh, uh, if you look at uh, which Internet of Things uh, had been selling uh, reasonably well, uh, smart lights, and especially the smart lights made by Philips, are the biggest sellers. I've been trying to find out uh, exactly how many smart lights Philips had sold. I couldn't find any uh, reliable figures, but I assume that they sold at least hundreds of thousands of them so far in the last three years. Okay, so this is the uh, Philips U system, and uh, um, it, uh, of course, Philips is one of the world's largest uh, corporations, and they employ thousands of engineers. That's a hint to the number that uh, solves the puzzle in the, in the title. And uh, we decided to uh, test the actual security of the system. So. I'll give you a crash course of one minute about what, uh, what's involved. Uh, each installed light that you screw into the socket is connected to a central controller uh, wirelessly using a protocol which is very important in IoT. That's probably one of the main protocols that will be in use. It's called Zigbee. And the Zigbee light link, ZLL, by the way, in Israel it means dead, but that's a different story. Uh, is uh, 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 enabling the controller to uh, send instructions to the uh, smart light. The light controller itself is connected to your secure home office uh, uh, Wi-Fi network, or you can also connect it through a wire, and you use your smartphone in order to issue instructions. You can ask uh, each uh, uh, light 
uh, to uh, turn on or off or to uh, increase or decrease the intensity or change the color, etc. Very nice and convenient system. Now, how about the security? It uses all kinds of uh, clever cryptographic schemes, uh, looks solid. Uh, in particular, the way you initialize it and uh, associate it with a particular controller is uh, to bring the controller to within 10 to 20 centimeters from the smart light. Otherwise, uh, from further away, it's not supposed to, uh, uh, to obey any instructions. This is only initially. After it had been paired together with the uh, controller, you can move the controller to a different room and still uh, control the smart light. Okay, so they have this uh, proximity test, and of course you can try to overcome it from far away by using a very strong uh, signal, but uh, you know, because signal uh, decays uh, quadratically, uh, once you get to uh, 100 meters away, there's no chance that you'll, be, you'll have enough power in order to overcome this proximity test. But uh, as we heard uh, yesterday in uh, the uh, invited talk by Brian Sniffen, implementers will skip all imaginable checks. And we actually found an amazing bug. Uh, it's, it may be the first zero-day bug. Uh, do I hear anyone wanting to buy uh, zero-day bugs here? <laughs> no. Uh, one million bitcoins. Uh, so, what did we do? We bought a very cheap uh, um, Zigbee uh, um, evaluation kit. It cost a few dollars and uh, it weighs only a few grams. Here you can see uh, somebody holding the evaluation kit and uh, this is the computer science department at the Weizmann Institute and we are actually having fun taking over uh, all the uh, smart lights in the computer science building. But th this was not uh, uh, fair enough. We wanted a harder challenge. So we went to one of the most famous buildings in Israel. This is a building which has the highest concentration of cybersecurity companies in Israel, maybe in the world. It has the RSA company, uh, the EMC, uh, uh, Oracle. Uh, the Israeli CERT, by the way, is just next door. Uh, they are responsible for cybersecurity protecting the whole of Israel. So what we did was uh, to use a uh, quadcopter. Uh, we tied our attack kit, which weighs only a few grams underneath, and we started our attack from 400 meters away. And uh, the next movie will show you what uh, we did. So uh, watch carefully. As soon as you'll see uh, lights in that building uh, starting to flicker, it means that uh, we are taking over all the lights in that building. And uh, um, let's run the movie. OK, so you'll start by uh, uh, having a, a view of the drone on the ground. Then later on, we'll switch to the view of the drone's camera. We are taking off, and we are hundreds of meters away from that uh, building, about 400 meters away, and you'll see that some of the lights will start flickering already. We are flying stealthily along the railway line, uh, approaching this building, and uh, the lights are all obeying our instructions. And uh, if you look, look very carefully, those of you who know Morse code will immediately realize that this is did did da 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 did did da 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 SOS, we are being hijacked. All the lights in that building are doing this. OK, I thought about uh, uh, bringing the drone here and flying over Santa Barbara. And uh, I have no idea how many smart lights. Philips smart lights are uh, installed by Santa Barbara residents. But within a couple of hours, I could, could probably disable all of them just by flying the drone around. We informed Philips about it. And uh, they confirmed that uh, uh, the bug is real. And uh, they thanked us, and now they're scratching their heads how to fix uh, the problem with this huge number of installed devices. So this is a warning sign about the security of IoT devices. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So that concludes the Rome session, but I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank various people. So first of all, uh, the speakers for, I think, uh, contributing some very excellent talks and uh, very funny ones as well. Uh, secondly, uh, the people at the front and at the back uh, from the AV systems uh, for their excellent help uh, with, uh, well, making sure that everything uh, went smoothly. Uh, Brian Lamechia, the general chair for uh, setting out also the extra room. Um, and then uh, Joanne for getting me some tea. <laughs> And I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank Martijn for being such an excellent senior vice presidential Olympic rump session committee member. Thank, thank you. you. I'd thank like you, to thank you as well, yeah. Kenny. And we'll be looking for new rump session chairs next year because we're done, all right? <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope you had a good time. See you next year. Thank you.